So, for our static lighting, we're using light maps. Same as Quake 1, same as Quake 2. It covers the same world area as Quake 2. One light map pixel covers two square feet. This corresponds to 132 by 32 texture block. Previously, it would have corresponded to 116 by 16 texture block, but since we doubled the texture density, uh, it does cover a more number of texels, even though the world space units stayed the same. <clears throat> we are using direct lighting again, a la Quake 1. Uh, we're not using radiosity currently. It's for several reasons. Um, the first is a stylistic thing. Okay, hold on. Sorry. I just don't need to be so, like, freaky about this. But I have these teleprompters right here, so, like, every time I, like, look over there, it's like, hey, cool shotgun. Okay, cool. All right, sorry. A little idiosyncrasy there. Um, all right, so we're using direct lighting. Quake 1 uses direct, used direct lighting with a linear fall off. This, we're now currently using direct lighting with a more proper one over R squared fall off. Um, but the stylistic thing with the radiosity is that with Quake 2, there was a complaint amongst our level designers, and I believe along, amongst a lot of our users, that world field sort of washed out. And that's what happens. Radiosity basically brightens up the whole world because you're now bouncing light everywhere. It was extremely difficult for level designers to get hard shadows. And that was one of the cool things about Quake 1 is, you know, light would shine in through a window with a grate and you'd get these nice hard shadows. But everything just sort of mushed out and became very diffused. So there's a stylistic element to that. Um, and, you know, I personally prefer the direct lighting, even though I know it's far more inconvenient to work around when trying to do brightly lit levels you can see things. But I also understand that you just can't do the drama with it. On top of that, it's just pretty difficult to do radiosity with the curved surfaces. I mean, there's just a host of technical issues with that computing form factors and dealing with different subdivisions and all that kind of stuff. So it was also just a hard problem. So our diffuse light maps are basically done the way we've always done them, which is we take them, we do source times desk blending. We render them into the frame buffer, assuming we don't have multi-texture. We render it into the frame buffer, and we render the diffuse one on top, and we just multiply the two. Our dynamic lights are handled through, we al allocate three light maps that are just there for dynamic lights. They're D light zero, D light one, D light two. They're all 128 squared. Whenever we need to do dynamically modified light maps, we write into these and we upload them with text sub image. It is actually advantageous to upload text sub image, even if you're, I'm sorry, to use GL text sub image over GL text image, because text sub image uses the one that's already, that you've currently allocated. Text sub image, I'm sorry, text image sets your internal format, your dimensions, and things like that. Text sub image just changes the contents. If you were to actually use text image every single frame to upload these, the driver would actually have to go off and do a lot more, you know, munging and shuffling around of things, and there would be a performance cost. So all else being equal, once you've created a texture, you should probably use text sub image if performance matters to you. 